Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU, where we break down medical concepts and make them super easy for you to understand. Today is a video that you all requested and that is because we are celebrating having reached 10,000 subscribers. So thank you all to everybody who subscribed or who's ever watched any one of these videos. Many of you wrote to us with absolutely fantastic questions. Honestly, a lot of them really deserve their own video. So we picked 10 and kind of one bonus question and we divided the questions and answers into two videos. So this is part one of a potpourri of just random questions that you asked about neonatology. So number one, Christian Strisco, I hope I pronounced that right, asked us to address inborn errors of metabolism. Again, this definitely needs its own video, but I'm gonna go through some key points right now. The most important thing in my mind about inborn errors of metabolism is that you always have to be thinking about it because it is very, very easy to miss. So anytime anything really weird or unexpected is happening, just make sure that you're thinking about inborn errors of metabolism. So for example, on the physical exam, if for no reason at all, the baby becomes really floppy or really lethargic, then remember inborn errors of metabolism. If you find really weird or abnormal lab findings with kind of no explanation, like a really hypoglycemic kid whose mother is not diabetic or was an LGA or SGA or preemie, or suddenly you have really bad thrombocytopenia and you just can't explain why, then think of inborn errors of metabolism. Then if you do suspect it, and again, have a really low threshold for suspecting an inborn error of metabolism, then you need to make sure that you check the glucose if you haven't already done it, check for acidity. So either check with a blood gas or on a chemistry, you can check the bicarb level, or in addition to that, you can send the lactic acid or lactate level. And then the third thing that you definitely need to check is the ammonia level. And remember, this often requires a specialized tube to be sent to the lab. So make sure that you're sending that correctly. Very often that needs to be sent on ice. Then again, if you suspect it, then make the baby NPO. A lot of the problems with the inborn errors of metabolism is that the babies lack the enzymes to be able to break down and metabolize the protein or the fats or the glycogen that they have in their liver. So we don't want to add any more exogenous substrates that the babies are unable to break down. So make the baby NPO and just start the baby on a D10 IV fluid drip. So about 120 mLs per kilo per day. Again, we don't want to give protein because we don't know if that baby is unable to metabolize the protein. Make sure that you also follow up on the newborn screen. As you know, in America, a lot of these newborn screens will catch the inborn errors in metabolism and have a very, very low threshold to call a metabolic or genetic specialist. Ultimately, those are the people that are gonna help us take care of these babies. Okay, number two, Carmen Galindo asked us how to interpret CSF results from an LP or lumbar puncture or spinal tap. As you all know, there's a lot of discussion about the exact parameters that we can or can't accept in CSF of neonates. Also, as you also know, the CSF results can reveal a lot of things that aren't necessarily related to meningitis. But for the purposes of this answer, I'm going to discuss kind of the CSF results that we can accept or not accept or be more concerned about with bacterial meningitis. In older kids and adults, a normal CSF contains no more than five WBCs per millimeter cubed. However, in babies, term babies as well as preterm babies, they can naturally have a much higher WBC count. So it's a pretty imprecise number, but a normal CSF in preemies and term babies can have somewhere between 15 and 30 WBCs per millimeter cubed. So logically, if a baby has above, let's say 30 WBCs per millimeter cubed, then we are a lot more worried about meningitis. Other markers of meningitis are a high protein and a low glucose. A preterm baby can have a little bit more protein in its CSF than a term baby. But if a preterm baby has more than 150 milligrams per deciliter of protein in its CSF, and a term baby has above 100 milligrams per deciliter of protein in its CSF, again, those are both concerning numbers for meningitis. A CSF concentration of glucose less than 26 to 35 milligrams per deciliter is also concerning for meningitis. Really, that number is kind of like 
very vague because it really does also depend on what the baby's sugar level is in the blood. The way I normally think about it is if the sugar level in the CSF is significantly lower than the sugar level in the blood, then that's really concerning for meningitis. And the way that you can think about this is that you would expect a high protein level in meningitis because there'd be lots of like inflammatory proteins as well as immunoglobulins that are trying to actually fight the infection. Um, and so the protein level would go up, but also they would be using up a lot of sugar and the bacteria would be using sugar as well. So the sugar level would go down. Remember, because of the kind of tougher anatomy in neonates, you can often end up with a traumatic tap, which means that as you're putting the needle in to try to get the CSF, you inadvertently puncture a blood vessel. So in that case, you're going to end up with loads and loads of red blood cells. And normally we consider it a traumatic tap if a baby has above 1000 red blood cells per millimeter cubed. As you would expect, if you do have a traumatic tap, then the amount of protein that you have in the CSF can go up a lot. In fact, it's estimated that for every 1000 red blood cells per millimeter cubed, it increases the protein level in the CSF by between 1.5 and 1.9 milligrams per deciliter. So a traumatic tap, you're going to end up with higher protein levels. Obviously, a traumatic tap will increase the WBCs as well in the CSF fluid that you're checking because you're not just letting in the red blood cells when you puncture a blood vessel or the white blood cells will come in as well. There is an equation, obviously, that we can figure out what percentage of those WBCs come from the blood vessels and I can discuss that at some point in the future. Generally, though, infectious disease specialists don't really trust CSF results if the RBC count is somewhere above a thousand. The other thing that you're looking for on the CSF results that may make you think that this is meningitis is the actual differential of the cells. Generally, if you have more than about 70% neutrophils, then you are more worried as well about meningitis. Ultimately though, as you all know, what really diagnoses meningitis for us is having a positive culture from the CSF fluid. The problem with the neonates is very often we are starting antibiotics um, even before we're getting the CSF results because the baby's too unstable to tap the baby or we just want to get the antibiotics in as quickly as possible. So very often it's pre-treated so you may not even get a positive culture even if the baby really did have meningitis. So obviously in these situations you really don't want a traumatic tap because you need the cell count and the protein and the glucose to be able to to actually interpret the results. Okay, question number three is from Lydia Aprikadui. I hope I pronounced that right. And she asked, how do you insert an umbilical venous catheter so that it doesn't go into the liver? I really wish I had the answer to this question. Basically, I was always taught that UACs are skill and UVCs are luck. But there are a couple of tricks or things that you could try to do to help the catheter get to the inferior vena cava or the IVC, which is ultimately where you want that catheter to reach. So first, some anatomy. The reason why we can even get the umbilical venous catheter into the IVC is because there is the ductus venosus. So this is a vessel that babies have in utero that allows blood coming back from the placenta to go through the umbilical vein, bypasses the liver, and then goes into the IVC. So the ductus venosus, just like the PFO, as well as the um, ductus arteriosus, are all kind of shortcuts that blood can travel through so that in utero, the fetus gets exactly the blood that it needs where it needs it. After the ductus venosus has kind of taken its curve off, the umbilical vein basically flows into the portal vein, which is like inside the liver. So the first issue is, is that if the ductus venosus is closed, so this could happen immediately after birth, or basically the later that you try to put in the UVC, the higher the chance that the ductus venosus is closed. So if the ductus venosus is closed, then there's basically nowhere else for this catheter to go but into the liver. In those cases, there really isn't a lot that you can do. The ductus venosus is closed, you really don't have your shortcut to get to the IVC. Sometimes, however, the ductus venosus is still open, but for whatever reason, you just can't quite get that UVC to kind of make that curve and go in the right direction. And in this case, there's a couple of things that you can try at least. 
The first thing I like to do is that as I'm threading the umbilical venous catheter, I pull down on the umbilical stump kind of in the direction of the legs. Sometimes that really helps straighten out the vessels so it makes it more likely that the catheter wants to take the path through the ductus venosus. Then the second thing that you could try to do, which again sometimes works, is keep the catheter in that you know is going into the liver. So it's kind of going in the wrong direction. And your hope here is that that catheter is actually blocking the access to the liver. So if you put in another smaller catheter, then your hope is, is that because the um, direction into the liver is blocked, then this catheter is more likely to want to go through the ductus venosus and into the IVC. Again, sometimes it works. Just a reminder, if you're really desperate for venous access and you can't get the catheter to go into the IVC and it just keeps going into the liver, then just pull that a UVC down below the liver and leave in a low-lying catheter. A low-lying UVC is still way better than no venous access at all. The fourth question is from Dowboy490 and his question was, how much, if at all, does early fortification of feeds increase the risk of neck? Is there less risk when using HMF instead of formula powder? Hello Dowboy490, love the name. We know from very solid meta-analyses that giving babies human breast milk versus formula decreases the incidence of neck. But honestly, that's pretty much where our certainty with feeds and neck pretty much ends. So for example, some smaller studies show that fortifying feeds early, so kind of like at 40 ml per kilo, doesn't really increase the risk of neck versus fortifying feeds at a higher volume, so like at 120 ml per kilo. In fact, we haven't really been able to prove whether fortifying feeds at all does increase the risk of neck or doesn't affect the risk of neck at all. And honestly, nobody really wants to run this study. We know that fortifying breast milk greatly helps with the growth of babies as well as the development and neurodevelopmental outcomes of babies. So nobody wants to do a study where we're like comparing just pure breast milk and fortified breast milk just to see if that does increase the incidence of neck. A bunch of smaller studies have been done comparing the incidence of neck in human milk-based fortifiers, so what's called prolactra in the US, versus a bovine or cow milk-based fortifier. And some studies show that there might be a slightly decreased risk of neck with the human milk-based fortifiers, but even this hasn't been categorically proven. And the fifth question today is from Kanisha McDowell, who sent in some absolutely fantastic questions. So thank you so much, Kanisha. And her question is, is what would be considered hypoglycemia in a neonate? This is an eternally asked and an eternally studied question. And the issue is, is that it's a really difficult thing to tease out because really we should only care about a low sugar if it has a negative effect on the baby, whether it's a short-term negative effect or a long-term negative effect. So a short-term effect could be a seizure. Obviously, this would be a very negative effect from hypoglycemia. And a longer-term effect that we would worry about persistent hypoglycemia is if it affects development in the future. As you can imagine, this is really, really hard to tease out because there are so many variables that may also affect a baby by the time that you're following up them up in several years to see if that bout of hypoglycemia affected them. So it's just really, really difficult to get perfect data on these babies. The other couple of points that I want to make about hyperglycemia is that it's probably not just one low value that will affect a baby long term, but just a persistent hyperglycemia for several hours or several days that's much more likely to affect long term development. And also, so if you think about it, we're not going to let these babies stay with a sugar level of 20 for several days. And so really, it's very difficult to tease out that one exact number. The other thing that we do need to consider when we do get an infant with a low glucose is that it might be related to a completely different disease process altogether. So the baby might have pan hypopit or fatty acid deficiency, or maybe the pancreas in the baby is just has an insulin secreting tumor or something. So remember that you also need to be kind of thinking beyond the box and not just treating the hyperglycemia. And some recent papers are suggesting that the numbers that we've all been using in the NICU are probably going to change again. But 
Eventually I will get to a whole video on hyperglycemia, but for now these are kind of the numbers that we all seem to be following. So generally in the first 24 hours of life, we want the sugars above 40 milligrams per deciliter. Between 24 and 48 hours of life, we want the sugars above 50 milligrams per deciliter. And after 48 hours of life, generally we want the sugars about above 60 milligrams per deciliter. With all of these numbers, obviously we care a lot more about hyperglycemia if the baby is also symptomatic. So if the baby is jittery or lethargic or in respiratory distress, then we should be a lot more aggressive in treating these babies. Okay, that was the first five questions of our 10K question and answer session. Thank you again so much for subscribing and for being here. We really appreciate you.